And as all children up to sixth grade are dismissed to their service. Follow Pastor Drew to the back, stay in the foyer, and he will take you downstairs as the rest of us turn to the book of Acts, chapter number 5. Acts chapter number 5. Last week we started a series, probably will go about five weeks, entitled Illusions, Lies That Blind. And uh, I don't know if you've ever been to, how many of you have ever been to a fair or something or something where they have a magic show? Maybe seen them on TV? Uh, I love watching those. Uh, I get geeked out because I know that's not real, but they've got to be doing something. And I remember once there was a TV show that I got up with that was going to debunk all of the most popular things. Like when they cut the woman in half. I know this is going to blow some minds here. They don't actually cut her. You know, that just blew my mind, you know, that they actually didn't do that. And, uh, but I, they would show in different things, and even when they got done showing it, I'm like, what? how they do that? And some of these people are amazing, and they use illusions. They, they use mis, uh, mis, misuse of the hands, or, or they grab your attention somewhere else, and so what's happening in the background you don't see. And as much as we watch something like that, we sit back and, man, it is cool. Man, I need him to come and fix my, bill, you know, my billing problem at home. That's not, what, that's not real. They've, they've, they've mastered the art of illusion. It's not real. Now, you can go to, some people will go to a psychiatrist today, and they'll do everything, or not a psychiatrist, to a psychic, about the same, but a psychic today, you know, with the goal of saying, what's happening tomorrow? What football team should I invest in? Or what this or that? And, you know, it doesn't make a difference. We want to know about tomorrow, don't we? We all want to know what's going on. And, and sometimes, I'm comfortable. We don't like the idea of not knowing what's coming next. Yet, even in the day we live, Satan uses illusions. He uses lies to get our attention, to, to trick us. He gets us to not completely believe the Bible. He gets us to not completely believe another person. When somebody does something, we come up and say, you know, I know they said that, but this is what they really meant. You ever done that? Someone walks to you and does, says something to you, I know they said this, but this is what they really meant. That's not what they, how do you know? I mean, if you had done that, maybe... You know, I've watched, I've even seen people do this. Someone walks up and gives them a gift. Hey, I really appreciate that. And the person walks away and the guy goes, what are they hiding? There's something going on. I'm going to find out what it is. It's never, oh, thank you for the wonderful gift. We live in a day, we don't trust people. We just don't trust anybody. Since I've lived in our home now just over a year and a half, I've had about eight different people knock on my door and try to sell me something. My favorite part is when they try to sell me something I have. And I walk out there. The other day, a guy's trying to send me something. He's got umbrellas raining. And I kept saying, just walk under the porch. We have a roof. And he held the umbrella right out there. It's like, really, come on in. I'm not going to shake your hand. It's dripping over your umbrella. Come on in. He's standing back there like, you know, a law. Or maybe he was afraid my little dog I was holding was going to kill him or something. I don't know. And he wouldn't get close to me. But they tried. And at one time, they were trying to sell me something. I had a, a TV program, a package. And I'm like, I have that. Well, you know. And they kept going through. And I'm seeing it back in my mind. Was I not clear? Did I stutter? I mean, he, I have that. I mean, you can see the big thing hanging off the roof, can't you, with the name of your company on it? Do you miss something? So I told him, I said, I don't know if you noticed the satellite dish. I have this. I know, but we got a better package. No, I have your package. So he goes and describes the package I have. We can even upgrade you to a certain DVR. I have that. My favorite part. So you don't want it? I'm going to let the dog go. All right, that's all that's going to happen. I'm going to let the dog go and see what happens. And it's like, do you even realize that I'm speaking words here? You know, it's like if I sign up, you know, you, I mean, I even asked him once, here's the deal. I think you get like commission. If somebody who's already a customer signs up, do you get a deal off this? I'll sign it. They'll call me. I'll say I have it. We move on with life. No, no, you got to be, you can't be an existing customer. So do you want it? Uh, you know, it's, but they come in, they want to trick you. This is the best package. My favorite is, it's only, you ever heard the phrase only? It's only $79 a month. And so the guy standing there, one guy tell me this, tell me something, Verizon, only $79 a month. I said, well, how much are the taxes? Well, how much is the DVR? Well, and I got done. I was like, so you mean $130 a month? Well, if you want to put it that way, yeah. That's what's coming out of my pocket, which is almost double what you're saying. And they they. they, they Sneak people in. I was very good at that when I worked in sales. I worked selling electronics. And then I was. You have to do it. And then I worked in jewelry for a little bit. 
And you, you walk in, the guy's like this huge TV. I'm talking the old projection screen TVs, you know, now that most of our kids like, yeah, I remember my grandparents had one of those. <laughs> but I sold those at one point. They were top of the line. And these people would walk in, they had no money, but for $10 a month, I could put a TV that would not fit into their trailer. And I could get it if I could sell it to them. Guy walks up, I'm working at Friedman's Jewelers, and he walks up with, with his girlfriend. Let me tell you guys, when you finally go around to buy a, a diamond ring for your girlfriend, don't bring her. Okay? There's a lot of reasons. One, buy it yourself, all right? Take a woman who knows what they're doing and, or another guy who's done right. But she's going to sit there. If you pick the small one, you're going to see. I remember, he picked up the smallest one he could. And she took a step back, and she's like fighting tears as they're rolling in her eyes. And I'm thinking, how dare he do this? I mean, it's like a $300 ring. And you know that the, the, the higher quality the diamond is, the clearer it is because it's from coal. And he's looking at this thing that I'm convinced they just pulled out of the coal mine. I'm like, dude, it's darker than the gold on the ring. And I finally, he's sitting there and she's wiping tears and I leaned forward and I said something and he looked at me and I won. I said, is that really all she's worth to you? <laughs> it's wrong. He bought the one carrot and we moved on with our day. <laughs> and I was that girl's best friend. She thanked me every time she came to make the payment because she made the payment. Thank you. This is beautiful. And I'm like, I already got paid. I really don't care. I got the commission a while back. We're good with it. We deceive. We use illusion. And that's why it can happen. Now, that was not deceptive. That was manipulative. There's a big difference there. <laughs> Y'all caught that, huh? <laughs> They're all like, we've learned a little bit too much about our pastor this morning. I know there's people in here who sell cars. You know exactly what I'm talking about, right, Chris? <laughs> I have to make, I have to eat, okay? I'll never forget, I was trying to buy a car, and I'm, I'm not, like, I couldn't afford the one he wanted. He goes, I need to eat too. I said, but I don't need to lose my house over your food. I mean, come on, I'm buying a car here. When we look at Acts chapter 1. Let's look at Acts chapter 1. We're going to read the first few verses, starting in verse 1. I'm sorry, Acts chapter 5. I said that wrong. You're all going back to where you just were. <laughs> Acts chapter 5, starting in verse number 1. The Bible says, But a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira his wife sold the possession and kept back part of the price, his wife also being privy to it, and bought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost? and to keep back part of the price of the land? Whilst it remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? That was not lied unto men, but unto God. And Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and gave up the ghost, and great fear came on all them that heard, him, heard these things. And the young men arose, wound him, wound him up, and carried him out and buried him. And it was about the space of three hours after when his wife, not knowing what had, ha, was done, came in. And Peter answered and unto her, Tell me whether ye sold the land for so much. She said, Yea, for so much. Then Peter said unto her, How is it that ye have agreed together to tempt the Spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of them which have buried thy husband are at the door, and shall carry thee out. Then she fell down and straightway at his feet, and yielded up the ghost. And the young men came in and found her dead, and carrying her forth, buried her by her husband. And great fear came upon all the church, and as upon many as heard these things. Father, we love you. We thank you for the truths of the word of God. And Lord, as we look at a story, that Lord is a very unique and a weird story for most of us to think of someone being called, caught dead in church, Father, being called down for a lie. Help us, Lord, to understand the principles, what God is trying to teach us here, what really happened. And Father, help us to apply these own principles to our daily lives. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to talk about the first lie. Last week, we talked about a great deception. The first lie today is no one really knows. You ever been convinced that you can go and live a certain way and no one really knows? Some other people put it, you know, that um, I can lie and my secrets are safe. One of those. No one really knows or my secrets are safe. Now, one of the things that I think is so important when we come to a local church, we talked about this in our class this morning, is that sometimes we come into church and we have to be, you've heard the idea of church E, you know what I'm talking about? There's certain things you're supposed to do. It's like all week long you haven't done this and you walk into church, hey brother, hey sister, you know, and you know, you know let me tell you what, I know why each and every one of us use the phrase brother and sister. I'm going to call you out on this, okay? You walk up to somebody and you're like, I should know them. And I cannot remember their name. I think it's, I think it's John, 
but I don't think so. Maybe it's Bill. Hey, brother, how you doing? Sometimes you even go, hey, brother, sister, you know, sitting there. And the worst part is I did that once and someone says, you know my name. I did 10 minutes ago until you walked up here and my mind is blank. And it's bad, you know, especially when you turn around to yell at your kids, you've done that. Hey, kid, come here. You know, it's just blank. You're too irritated. Well, we come to church, we put on this front. Well, pastor's got to see me a certain way, and the deacons do, and we got to dress a certain way, we got to do all that. And I'm not saying that looking nice and, do, and coming and, and wanting to have a heart of worship is wrong in church, but if we do it to impress other people, we've missed the entire point. You think, nobody knows. I, I put on a good front. I'm convinced of my great image, and people look back and say, boy, if they only realized. Because you know what happens is if it's not real, in the middle of our conversation, we'll say something we didn't even realize we said. Like, man, what, what, where did that come from? Why? Because it's not real. You know what God wants us to have in our walk with God? Not a front that looks good to someone sitting next to you. Not a front that looks good to the preacher or to Pastor Drew or to a deacon. He wants you to be honest. You see, but Pastor, you don't understand. If I'm honest, people may not like me. No. You know one of the things that I struggle with more than anybody is someone who lies to me. How many of you love it when someone lies to you? Excited, right? The only time I want them to lie to me is when they, want, they really think I'm ugly and they don't want to tell me, you can lie then. Or if you really like my hair, which is going away, you can lie then. All right, no. You don't want them to walk up. You know, it's one of those things. Your wife comes home. Man, this is one of the worst questions. Women, let me do, do, do us a favor. Just don't ask this question, okay? You will save our lives and your marriage. You buy this new dress and you put it on and you walk out. Does it make me look fat? What do you want us to say? Because if we say no, you're just saying that. If we say yes, we get a fork in the eye. I mean, it just doesn't work. If your wife walks in, can you give me an advice if you wonder why the front door is, why? Because the husband's running out. I don't have an answer for that. I got my hair cut. What do you think? You know, and all three hairs are still standing up because they buzzed you. Um, that, one, that one in the middle is beautiful. Oh, what are we supposed to say? And then my favorite phrase, don't lie to me. Beyond words. You want us to be honest. And see, what God wants us to be honest, let me tell you why. Because sooner or later, if I put on a front in church long enough, I begin to believe it. God doesn't want me to put on a front. He wants me to be honest. You're not here to impress me or anybody else in this building. You're here to worship and learn more about God. And by the way, you can't grow until you acknowledge where you are and take that step. No one, I promise you, no one in this church is going to walk up and say, I can't believe you're in this spot in your spiritual life. You know what they're going to say? It's great to see you, brother, sister. Let me help you. Let me help you grow. This is not one of those churches where you'd walk in and you say, well, I didn't wear a suit today and someone's going to get on my case. So, don't wear a suit. But come to church. Some of you know that there's a big debate now. Should I bring my Bible or can I use my tablet? Can I use my phone? You know, it, you know there's some people, I don't want you to use phones. Oh, I don't mind using your phone as long as the Bible app's open and not Twitter. That's all I'm asking, okay? Or video camera watching all this because we've already got like four, three going on. But... Watching to make, you know, see if you make a mistake. But it's, it's, we come in and we got all these things we've got to fit. That's not what God's looking for. God is looking for us to be honest with ourselves and with him. Because by the way, he knows what's really going on. And I put on a front, I'll begin to believe it. Today we call this idea of hypocrisy. I, I talk a good talk, but I don't live it. I believe we need to be careful of this term hypocrisy. It's often taken out of context. Those living in sin who don't like the fact they're living in sin and Satan's convicting them will accuse others of judgmentalness and, and hypocrisy. Why? Because they're living in sin. And the only way they can feel better is accuse us of being hypocrites. Well, no one in that church is perfect. By the way, no one in our church is perfect. You realize that, right? I know, three of you, I just broke your heart, all right? No one in this church is perfect. Everyone, including the guy standing up here, is full of sin. The key is whether I acknowledge it and I get it right with God. So when someone looks at me and says, you're a hypocrite, I say, no, I'll be the first to tell you I struggle with sin. The difference here is I acknowledge it and I'm getting it right. You want to admit it's okay. That's the problem with most people running hypocrisy is it's covering something they don't want to get right. We're not called to be perfect. But living a life of sin, just to say, I'm, I'm transparent, I'll just live a horrible life. That's not what God wants either. It's just about being honest. I like what it says in 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 22. And Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken 
and the fat of rams. You know what he's saying? You can look as spiritual as you want. You can give money. You can do all those. But if you're not living in obedience, that's not pleasing to God. God would rather me do nothing in sacrifice of giving but obey. Now, by the way, when I obey, I will do those things. But we put on this front, so I'll look good. God says, I don't want that front. I want the real person. God's not looking for perfection, but for an honest and true heart. We see three things from this passage in this area and this idea that no one really knows how I can hide my secrets. The planning of deception, number one. The planning of deception. Acts 5, verse 1. But a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, sold the possession and kept back part of the price his wife also was being privy to it and bought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. Now, before you can go through and wonder, why did Peter kill two people in church, all right? You need to understand what's going on here. Let me give you a little history. Many of you remember that a lot of people had come when Je- when around the time of Jesus' death. A lot of Jews had come for their time of worship and celebration at the temple, and they had come, and a lot of amazing things had happened. And so a lot of the Jewish people, instead of going to their homeland, stayed. So they didn't have a place to live and they don't have a place to go. And so a lot of the Jewish people in the churches were coming together and were selling portions of land or selling goods and giving it to the church to be given to another Jewish Christian brother to help them find a place to live. And they were given to people who didn't have money, didn't have food, all those things. And so people realizing, I have, they would sell it and they would give it as an offering in church to be distributed amongst those who have left their home and don't have anywhere else to go with it, don't have any money. And so it was given out that point. It was not something planned to be doing all the time. It was an immediate need, and this was an answer. We know that Barnabas had done this, and a lot of people had bragged, and Barnabas selling land. And and, and Ananias and Sapphira had to watch as these two people were lifted up as amazing Christians, because, or this man was lifted up as an amazing Christian because he had sold his land and gave it to the poor. So there was an honest, legitimate form of sacrificial worship taking place. Here's what happened. Ananias and Sapphira, they go home and they say, man, you see how they were praising Barnabas today? Oh, man, wouldn't it be great if they did it to us? I mean, come on, we got land. That, what, what, what can we do? And maybe Sapphira said, you know, Ananias, we could sell the land and do the same thing. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, come on, that's a lot of money. We, you know, maybe that came from our parents and we spent a lot of money earning it. We've taken care of it. I don't know if I can give all of that. And so they debated it. We see the planning of deception. Our choices are never have a singular effect. These two begin to talk about it. Men, let me encourage you. When something comes up and you, there's a certain direction, be the man in the home and say, no, this is where we're going. They came together. And the Bible says, and as Sapphire being privy to it, makes me wonder if it wasn't Ananias' idea. It doesn't make a difference. We need to encourage the right direction, not the opposite. The two came together. No decision you will ever make in life, no deception you will try to bring out will only affect you, I promise you. Parents, you think, ah, everybody's deceived except your kids who wonder why you have two different lives. Oh, nobody in church really knows who I really am except the people who you get close to and find out, man, that's different. Or the people at work who say, he goes to church? Are you kidding me? Ah, yeah, man, I, if that's the kind of church he goes to, I don't want to go to it. Look the way he's like at work or here. no. It never just affects one person. When I try to ha- deceive others, it hurts everybody around me. Honesty is what's an important thing. And so these two come together, and they say, here's an idea. We really like what they did to Barnabas. We want the same idea. Why don't we sell it? We just won't give all the money. We'll just keep back some of it. And then maybe, maybe Ann and I said, yeah, but if we do that, they won't brag on us like they did Barnabas. You know what? No one knows how much the land is worth. No one knows how much we're going to get from it. We'll keep back maybe a third of it, and we'll give the other two-thirds, and we'll just tell them we gave it all. Who's going to know? Really? Who's going to know? And that's the plan deception as they take off. Our choices never have a single effect. They affect more people. Number two, this type of thinking is never random or compulsive. To deceive somebody, to the plan, it's never random. It's never why I wake up today and say, you know what, I'm going to be around so-and-so today. I'm just going to put on the front. No. Because we have some reason why we want to put that out. And so we plan it, we put it together, and we say, and you know what I've heard? This is after 15 years, almost 16 years in ministry, I've learned one thing to be true. I hope it's not true. If it is, I'm not trying to be critical, I'm trying to challenge. I've known that some parents will sit around the table with their kids at dinner and sit there and say, now, when we go to church, this is how I want you to act. What they ask why we do this is what we don't do and don't do. And they got a list of things, the churchy things we don't do. Now, we'll still do them, just don't tell people at church we do them. That has been a proven fact. I've known it's been done. Put on a planned front. Let me ask you a question. What does that tell your kids about God? We put on a front. 
Or you shouldn't tell them that. That's not our church. That's our private life. Don't tell them we do that. Be honest. You know, if you're gonna, here's the one thing I try to tell parents. If you're going to live a certain way, own it. Don't try to play both ways. You know, serve God or serve man. But don't play around in the middle of it. This type of thinking is never random or compulsive. We plan it. Why do we plan this kind of stuff? Let me give you some thoughts. One, maybe we don't really want to grow. We, it's uncomfortable to take the steps of growth. Let me tell you another one I think maybe Sometimes we don't really think we can be what others want us to be. I don't think it's always a pride thing. I don't think it's always an arrogance thing. Sometimes we're nervous. I want people to like me. I want to fit a certain mold. And the only way I can do it is act it out. And I really don't know if I can be what does that want to be. If that's true, let me encourage you, you have a wrong impression of the people in our church. No one wants us to be anything but ourselves and what God has us to be. Sometimes we're convinced that this is really how church people should be. Maybe we've been in another church where you act a certain way. I'd known years ago there were certain churches, and uh, when I was in college, I was interviewed by one I found out to be a church like this, which is why we ended up not taking the church. But if, if women dressed a certain way, try to get in the church, they would say, you can come in, but we have clothes we want you to change into in the back here. Wouldn't you love it if we just had clothes hanging back there? You know, no, we're not going to do that. Because we're not out trying to put a front up. And let me tell you, sometimes, especially if you grow up in church and Christian school can add to this, well, they, i got to live this way, i got to do this, and you got all these rules around you. And so you say, this is how I should be. So at church I'll be this, and at home I'll be the opposite. That's the opposite of what God wants in our lives. If someone else has told you that you've got to fit a mold, it's not biblical, don't worry about what they tell you. Go back to the Bible. A lot of times they're preferential things. Here's what you do. Study the Bible. When I left college, I was encouraged to not follow uh, my beliefs based upon what other men have told me. Study the Bible. So I began under topical situations, under things that I've been told in my life were things we either we didn't do or we did do or preferential things or whatever, and I began to study the Bible. I didn't go, I asked some preachers, but most of it was Bible. Why this? Why this? Why this? You know what I learned? I became a stronger Christian in the area of doctrine and what God clearly states. And then I became a little balanced in the area of preference. What do you mean? There's things I do and there's things I don't do, but I don't expect anybody else to follow that list. Because that nobody else has to follow the list that I have for my home. Nobody. I encourage you, though, to have a list for your home. What, what will you do? What won't you do? What are the standards? And then teach your kids. You know what happens? Your kids will tell you something. I promise you. Well, so-and-so gets to do it. Then my favorite one. We're the only family in the world that does this. In your little world, probably. But that's okay. You know why? Because there is a reason. If I have a reason for what I do, I'm going to own it. And I'm not going to be ashamed of it. I'm not going to judge someone else from being different than me, but I'm going to own it. And I'm going to grow. Why? Because I want to grow. And I want my kids to see it. But I tell you, if my kids see me here at church saying, do it, do it, do it, and go home and say, don't tell people at church, now let's go out and do whatever we said we're not going to do, they won't want anything to do with God or church when they become my age. I need to be honest with them. They need to know who dad really is. And it shouldn't be any different than the dad standing right here. It's important for all of us to be that consistent. The planning of deception, number two, the problem of deception. Look at verse number three of chapter five. Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled thine heart to lie? Catch this, to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land. Whilst it remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not in thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. We see a couple things here. First of all, let me give you another bit of context here. He makes a phrase in here that's so important. He says two things. While it remained, verse 4, was it not thine own? And after you sold it, was it not thine own power? There was nowhere in any of this worship where anybody was required to do this. This wasn't like me getting up and saying, I believe God wants you to give 10%. I believe he does. That's not even that. This is above and beyond everything else. No one said, do it. Barnabas said, I have money. I can do it. Other people said, I have money. I can do it. And Ananias and Sapphira said, we have some money. We can look good. That's the difference. No one forced them to do this. A lot of people look at this passage and say, that's a judgmental, rough church. No, no one told them to do it. But there were some great acts of worship and sacrifice, and Ananias wanted to get in on it. But they didn't want to get on the worship and sacrifice. They wanted to get on the praise. And that's where the problem comes. Because was it not my own power? No one made you do this. This is your choice. 
And why would you come in and mock such great worship? To get something for yourself. And that's what Paul, Peter was telling. A troubling influence. It's interesting. Uh, verse 3, Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost? Think about that. He says, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Ghost? Now, by the way, this phrase, Satan made me do it, not true. Satan doesn't make you do anything. And James, the Bible says, every man is tempted when he's drawn away, what? By his own lusts and enticed. And then it turns to sin and then to death. Satan doesn't make me do anything. Now, Satan will throw temptations in front of me like he did Jesus. But he doesn't make me do anything. But he can put a mind. And Ananias was filled, the mind filled Ananias. His mind was filled with Satan's thinking. I can lie to the Holy Ghost. He was a pawn in a game between Satan and the Holy Ghost. But he was filled. Let me ask you this question. You ever thought where a person needs to be spiritually when this accusation can be thrown at them? That I would do something that I know is not pleasing to God. It's just a front. And Satan put that mind. That someone can say, why would Satan? How can you be filled with the thinking of Satan? That's how far we are from God. And by the way, that's how far they were. That instead of seeing the great worship and seeing the influence they could have and the blessing they could be to others, all they saw was, man, I want people to brag on me. That's how far they were from their walk with God. A troubling influence, then secondly, and an undeniable truth. Like we said, was it not in thine own power? No one made you do it. Ananias, no one made you sell it. And here, let me tell you something. It's a fact from this phrase. They could have walked in and said, we have sold our land and we've given a portion of the profits to the church. And no one would have had a problem with that. You know what? I'm going to take a wild guess. I wasn't there, so I'm going to, I'm going to take a wild guess. I'm going to guess if they had taken a portion of what they had sold and gave it to the church, people would have praised them for their sacrifice. But no, they had to, it's not even a fact. Giving was good. Selling and giving was a good thing. It became a problem when they lied about it. No, we, we've given, we, it's everything. I know, I know, I mean, back then, I know I kept one third of the profit back in my house. I mean, we're going to get a nice yacht or something and go out, you know. I don't know if you have yachts and, and, you know, out there, but a nice boat or something. I'm going to get something nice. No, they didn't. We've given it all. It all came down to being seen. It all came down to an undeniable truth. No one made them do it. It was of their own. Let me tell you, I've had so many people over the years come up and say, the preacher tells us we got to do this, and the preacher tells us we got to do this. The preacher preaches the Word of God. The Holy Spirit tells you to do it. And if I get up as a preacher and say, you should do this and you should not do this. Now, by the way, there are certain things in Scripture that are very, very clear you should not do. All right? You should be staying away from murder. Let's just go to the easy one, okay? There's 10 of them in the Old Testament I could follow. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not covet. You know, all those different things. So when you sit in your front yard and covet your neighbor's boat, all right, I, you, that's what God tells So I can get up and say, don't do it. Why? Because I'm just reading Scripture. But when I get up and there's certain things in your home, I'm not here to tell you, do this and don't do this. But when you walk away and say, man, I, I can't believe you said that, you know what it is? The Holy Spirit's doing work. Let the Holy Spirit do that work. No one forces you to do anything. I mentioned this when we were going through our stewardship series. We're to give not grudgingly or of necessity. Don't ever give because someone pushes. Give because God wants you to and it's pleasing to Him. Now, you say, I'm not going to give. Fine, we're still going to love you. Because you are to be in obedience to God. This is honesty before God, not before me or anybody else. No one forces us to do this. Why was this so troubling to the church? Why was it such a big deal that they ended up to lose their life over it. I believe this because they were doing it. They were doing what others had done in the right spirit, but they were doing it in the wrong spirit. They were mocking what God was doing. They were mocking what God truly saw as great worship. And they were doing it as an influence to other people. And God says, no, I'm going to get everybody's attention with this. You know, when it, it's funny when it says he lied to the Holy Spirit I have a tendency to believe personally that the Holy Spirit was working in Ananias' heart way before he got to that. I believe as he's walking in, the Holy Spirit's saying, Ananias, don't do it. Don't do it. Man, just tell him. If you, don't, if you don't want to give it all, fine. Just tell him what you gave. Just tell him you gave a portion. But don't lie. Don't do it. And yet he kept saying, no, I'm fine. And how many times do we convince ourselves? I know the Holy Spirit says I'm wrong and I should live this way. No, no, I'm fine. If there's nothing in the Bible wrong with it, I can live this way. And that's what we tell ourselves. And if we say it enough, we believe it. You ever heard the uh, story of 
the old man that fell asleep, the old man with a mustache, and he fell asleep. And his uh, grandson decided that he was going to uh, play a joke. So he pulls out, I don't know what kind, a really nasty mustard. He smears it on his mustache. The grandfather wakes up a little bit later. Man, what is that smell? And he goes to the kitchen. He pulls out the trash. He takes the trash out. He goes, man, this kitchen stinks. And he walks back to the living room. Is there sneakers or something in here? Man, this living room stinks. He walks back to his bedroom. And he goes, hon, what are you doing? This bedroom stinks. And I'm done with this. And he walks outside to his front yard. And the whole world stinks. I mean, no idea it was him the whole time. So many times we put out there, hey, it's someone else. It's someone else. It's someone else. No, it's, it's me that needs to grow. Me needs to be honest before God. Not a fake, but to be honest. Let's look at the last thing, the product of the deception. Verse, we won't read all verses 5 to 11 for time, but Ananias comes in and Peter confronts him. He holds to his ground and bam, drops dead. I'll never forget a couple years ago, this was, I was downstairs in Children's Church, or church is similar to this. It was back in Michigan. My dad's preaching, and I'm working down at Children's Church. I think I was in 7th or 8th grade. And all of a sudden, we're going through Children's Church, Pastor Brian's teaching, and I look up, and there's an ambulance sitting right outside the window. I'm like, oh, my, what happened? What happened? I'm hearing a lot of, um, a lot of rustling going on upstairs, and kids coming, parents coming to get their kids and leaving. And I, I walked up there, and my dad's as white as a ghost. I mean, he's sick. And I'm like, What happened? <laughs> and he named a guy sitting right back about where Kyle Lucas is sitting that in the middle of the service had a heart attack and died. Right there. He say, he goes, they, they brought, uh, the nurse was there, came, tried to revive him. He was gone before even when he was. He just, his, he just went to sleep. They said it was very peaceful. Went to sleep, never knew what happened. He never, it was just one of those, you know, no one would sit in that section of church. And I think it was out of respect, not for fear of being sick, but they just, they couldn't believe it. They, right in the middle of the service. Now, that's somebody who the Lord said, you know what, you're done, let's go home. This guy was taken from church earlier than he should have been because he lied to the Holy Ghost. Now, let me tell you, I don't believe that God's going to come down today and say, thou hast lied to the Holy Ghost, you're going home. I don't think he's going to kill people this morning, all right? He works a bit differently in the new te- later now than he did when the Holy Spirit was new. But he is working on your heart. He is coming down and saying, you know, He's not mentioned anything specific on purpose today, but there's something in your life. Just come get it right. Just be honest. Get that out of there. You don't need to lie to your, your family. You don't need to lie to your friends. You don't need to lie to church more than anything. You don't need to lie, to lie to God. Just be right about it and be honest. There's a strict response. The Lord kills two people in church. That's a pretty strict response. You want to get someone's attention? Have a very, very powerful punishment. You know, the weaker our punishment system gets in America, the more crime rate goes up. That's a proven fact. We won't debate all, you know, capital punishment and all that. We won't debate that, but it's a proven fact. When the criminal says, you know what, it doesn't make a difference. I'm not going to get in trouble. I was watching the news this week. I don't know what city it was in. I don't, I don't remember, I remember which one it was. So I won't even guess. Uh, there's kids driving up and down the road on four-wheelers, ATVs and things like that. And even though it's illegal, if the police officer turns them in, they're just going to let them go. They say it's not worth our time, it's not worth our fuss, so we're just not, it's still legal, and they know that, but the police officer would sit back and say, I'm going to write them up, I'm going to bring them in, and the moment I get there, they're going to be sent home with their ATV. What's the point? So the police officer sit there and watch them drive up and down the street. There was a video of it the other day on, on one of the news channels. Just watching as these guys are driving up and down the street, doing whatever they want. Why? Because someone told the cop, you can't do anything about it. Well, those kids are going to say, well, I am, you can't stop me. God wanted so honestly to tell the people, this is what we want in worship. And two people have totally dishonored this. And so I'm going to send a signal across. Now, do I believe they were saved? Absolutely. But I would not want to stand before God that way, personally. A strict response. My, you know, we must remember that the Lord does not see sin sometimes the same way we do. Malachi chapter 2, verse 11. Judah had dealt treacherously. And an abomination is committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. For Judah has profaned the holiness of the Lord. That's the problem. I was in um, chapel several years ago, preaching. Some kids in the back were joking around. I was still a youth pastor at the time. And I always had this system in place that I would point to the, all right, guys in the back. That way, if they knew I was talking, I didn't want to call them out. Guys in the back, calm down. Usually that worked. Every once in a while, those guys were like, no, we're not going. So it's usually one or two guys, and they were joking even more. And, and then I said, all right, gentlemen, I'd point to them again. 
that area. Right side corner. Please be quiet. And then everybody's like, which ones are they at this point? I haven't called them out yet. A few minutes later, they're still doing it, and I finally go, all right, man, I nail, I call the name. You say, that's rude. No, because you know what I'm watching? is that one kid decides he doesn't want to listen to preaching more and more and more being distracted by it. And I gave him three warnings before I called him out. And by the way, before chapel, I tell them, if you do this, I'll call you out. Why? And people come up and say, you're just offended. He wasn't listening to you. No, I'm offended he was ignoring this. You see, preacher, does it bug you when people text in church? Does it bug God that we don't care enough to put our phone away? Does it bug you that people may tweet a message in church? Does it bug you that you can't put away social media long enough just to worship God? We come to church, and we got all these things going on, and we're going to tip them. We're going to give them our, our one hour, and we're going to sing our songs and go home and live our life. And we come, and we have missed the holiness of God. And we go home and say, I went to church, and I can live any way I want to, and I don't care. And God is grieved in His heart. Because we put on a front. And you know what's missing? That relationship that many in this room enjoy so much. Not that anybody in this room is going to judge. What's missing is that sweet communion with God. I don't have that because I don't really care much about the holiness of God. If I learn care more, let me ask you this question. Don't answer out loud. If we really care more about the holiness of God, we view our sin differently. Yes. But we don't. Why is it so easy just for going to sin and then just confess it and move on? Because we've lost the view of the holiness of God. And that is why God was so serious. You have profaned the holiness of God in my house, and I'm not going to let that go. Let me ask you, men, standing in front of your teenage boy, and he sits there and he starts talking trash to mom right in your face. You're standing there. What do you want to do? Now, some men in here have already got the same picture I have. You know, he's going to be on the ground. His nose is a little crooked. You know what I'm talking about. We don't do it, but we want to do that. Why? For one simple reason. You don't talk to my wife like that. You can come to me, and you can come up and, 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 and mock and criticize. And we don't. I'm just saying. You can say something to me. It doesn't bother me. It doesn't. I don't mind. You can walk up, Pastor, on live stream. I love this one. You know, on live stream, you can see your bald spot. I'm turned around. It's bald. Yes, I know that. All right? My favorite one. You ever thought of Rogaine? Thank you. Have you ever thought of, like, the spray stuff where you can spray? And no one will notice that. How about makeup? No, I don't care. You know, I don't care. I can't see it. It doesn't offend me one bit. If my wife has a major problem with it, she can spray it one morning before I'm leaving. It doesn't bug me one bit. But people come to me, it's so funny. It glows on live stream. Be in church. It won't glow as much, all right? It doesn't bug me one bit. And you can walk up and say, Pastor, you did this. It, it doesn't bug me. And you can, criti- even if you criticize, it doesn't bug me. But you walk up to me and say, your wife did this. We're fighting. You can say anything you want to me. But you start ripping my family and my wife and every man in here should agree with this. That's a different subject. I don't care what you say about me, but you touch my family and we're, that friendship has gotten a little weaker. All of us should feel that way. Any mom and dad here, you make fun of a kid in front of mom. Remember the story of those bears that came out and killed the kids? They were all she bears. You know that, right? Female bears. That's what mom's like when you met. You say something, my mom, claws come out. I step back and say, dude, it's your fault, man. It's all yours. We would never allow that in our home setting. But yet somebody would do that to God. Okay. More, may we gain a proper view of the holiness of God. Instead of trying to put on a front, instead of trying to match certain things, and we can lie. No one really knows. Yes, God does. And he wants to bless you. But he can't because he's watching you put on a front and there's no reality. But you put on that reality and you say, God, it wants to be, I want it to be real. And then when it's real, man, it's sweet. It's so wonderful. And I'm not worried about what someone sees. If you catch me in the mall on Tuesday, I'm not worried. Oh my goodness, they caught me in the mall because outside of not being in a suit, I'm no different. You know, I, was, I went to um, uh, the fundraiser and, a, and the gospel man caught up. He said, I didn't even recognize you coming up. You know, he's joking about the fact, I'm not in a suit, you won't recognize me. You know, I had shorts and uh, you know, glasses and stuff. I didn't even see you coming. I could, for most people in church, if I put on my shorts and the sunglasses, I could sneak up behind you. You'd never know I was there. We, don't, you know, we shouldn't be. 
consistent. Just, just love the Lord and serve Him as you are and grow in Him. No one really knows. My secrets are safe. No. God sees them. And God wants. The Bible says, the eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. By the way, we like to focus on the evil. That's not when I focus on the good, too. You know the secret that's not safe? is when I serve God and no one knows it, God sees it. No one really knows. I hope you believe that. Proverbs 1, 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. But fools despise wisdom and instruction. I'm going to finish with this verse, James, 2, James 1, 22. But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving who? Your own selves. For if any man be a hearer of the word, like what we're doing now, and not a doer, which means doing something with it, he is like a man unto a man, beholding his natural face in the glass or a mirror. For he beholdeth himself, and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, the word of God, and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. He says, go to the word of God. Let this be your mirror. The hypocritical man looks down and says, wow, I need to change that. Got to deal with that issue. All right, see you later. No, not worried about it. It's like standing in front of a mirror and there's a huge blemish on your face and you sit there and say, I really should deal with this. I really should solve that problem. (laughs) Bye, I don't have to look at the rest of the day. I don't care. We wouldn't do that. God says, I want us to be doers, not just hearers. In Psalm 119, wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? You know what it says? By taking heed people say remember our scripture no 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 no. that's later taking heed according to thy word how do i become better and get rid of the junk in my past i add it with spiritual things you ever have an addiction you try to get rid of you know what the most important things to do to get rid of it you have to replace it with something if you don't replace it with something it's an open void and you're almost always going to go back to it if i'm growing in christ i've got to let the word of god clean out the old and bring in the new that's why when i'm newly saved it's going to take some time if i've been saved 30 years i should still be doing it because I want to be honest and I want to see God work in my heart father we love you we thank you for the time you've given us this morning thank you for the blessing of the day and the privilege we have to worship you and father even today as we've sung the songs that glorify you and preached your word Lord may it have lifted up the name of Jesus and may it truly have honored and proven the holiness of God I pray today if there's anyone here it's not for sure they're saved that today would be the day they'd accept Christ as their Savior. They would understand a sweet relationship with Jesus. But I pray for those here today that are struggling. Lord, they have, for whatever reason, right or wrong, have convinced themselves they've got to put on a front, and they don't, they've lost the joy of a sweet communion. Today is a day that they need to come and say, Lord, I don't want to fake it. I want to be real. May today be that day. With head bowed and eyes closed, because no one looking around. I'm going to ask you a couple of questions this morning. If you're here and you're not 100% sure you're saved, you say, I'm not sure if I'm saved. If I were to die today, I'm not 100% sure that I go to heaven. You know, the Bible tells you that you can know for sure you're on your way to heaven. At the same case, some people sit back and say, well, I think so. I, I can do it later. The Bible tells us that now with the accepted hand, behold, today is the day of salvation. So I ask you today, have you accepted Christ? You don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. Have you accepted him? If you haven't, I'd love a chance to pray for you. I'm not going to embarrass you. I don't want to call you out. But I want a chance to pray for you this morning. Just anonymously, not saying your name. You say, I really, Pastor, I'm not sure I'm saved. But I'd like to know more about it. If that's you, you do me a favor, just raise your hand. Say, I'm not sure I'm saved. Would you pray for me this morning? Second question is this. And I'm not going to ask for a raise of hand. Have we decided because we've been in church long enough or even new to church that we're putting on a front? I'm not saying we're hypocrites. I'm saying that we have lost the sweet communion with Christ, the honest communion. Maybe we need to get a greater view of the holiness of God. Maybe we need to just come to the Lord and say, there's been things in my life that I know are not pleasing to you, and today I need to get those things right. In a moment, as we have a time of invitation, I would encourage you to come if God lays it upon your heart. Father, as we come to this time of invitation here in just a moment, I pray you work on our hearts. I pray, Father, Lord, there's nothing I can do to change hearts, and Lord, I know that there weren't even some specific detailed things here this morning that was on purpose because the Holy Spirit's the one that does the work. I pray, Father, if the Holy Spirit's working in hearts, including mine, that we'd respond in the way you'd have us to. But no secret is really safe. We just need to be honest with you. And may you work in our hearts as we come to this time of worship. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand together with me, please. Head bowed and eyes closed. For those